Steve Koch you. Welcome to the Flying Squad. You know, people have been obsessed with flying for over a hundred years. Since the first motor operated aeroplane was invented in 1903 by the Wright brothers. Let's take a look. So here we can see the first ever aeroplane. Now, people have been obsessed with flying faster and faster and higher and higher. Now, before I go on, a lot of people think that humans had never traveled by air before the Wright brothers invented their plane. But in actual fact, three years before that, there was a Zeppelin invented in Germany. And before that, again, people had flown in hot air balloons. That was way back in the 1700s. Now, these hot air balloon journeys were not really a good means of travel. So when the first aeroplane was invented by the Wright brothers, this was revolutionary because people started to realize how fast, how high and how far that they could actually fly. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. I want you to imagine that someone has just built this flying machine back in 1903. And they say to you, hey, I've just invented this tiny little machine that can make you fly by using a motor. Now, by today's standards, that'd be like someone coming up to you and saying, hey, I've just built this teleporting machine and it can get you from here to Galway in three seconds. You want to give it a try? Would you? I don't know if I would. I'd probably be a little bit nervous. But nonetheless, the Wright brothers invented this airplane and humanity took to the skies and never looked down. So today, boys and girls, I thought we'd learn about one of the most famous pilots ever to take to the skies. Her name was Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart was born in Atchison, in Kansas in the USA, back in 1897. As a child, Amelia was always looking for challenges and she loved going fast. Whether it was sledding in the snow, rolling down hills, jumping off things from a height, Amelia was obsessed with flying and traveling fast. One day, she was at a fair and she saw a roller coaster. Her uncle helped her build a giant wooden roller coaster ramp in her back garden. So she sat in a wooden box and took off down this ramp, which started at the roof of a shed. So she flew down and she flew through the air and boom, crashed. She busted her lip open and she tore her dress, but she jumped up and she shouted to her sister, ha, it's just like flying. She didn't even care that she was hurt because she was so excited. Now, a little bit later on, Amelia saw her first airplane at a state fair and she got excited. Now, she lived in a time where it was very hard for women to get the jobs that they wanted. Nonetheless, Amelia always planned a future for herself and she decided at different stages that she wanted to become a lawyer or a filmmaker or an engineer. Now, these are jobs that would have been very hard for women to get back then. But Amelia didn't care. Now, that being said, she still had a keen interest in airplanes. And when she was older, she went to an air show with some friends. At the air show, there was a warplane flying and the pilot roared past the crowd to try and scare them. Amelia didn't even flinch. She later said, that little plane said something to me as it swished by. Now, the airplane I have in my hand wasn't one that looked like a warplane back then. This is just the type of airplane that we have now. There's lots of windows, it looks comfortable. They weren't like that back then. Now, Amelia took her first trip in an airplane back in 1920 at an airfield. And she said, by the time I was two or 300 feet off the ground, I knew. I had to fly. So she got to work. She saved her money so she could earn enough to pay for flight lessons. She got the lessons 
and she even saved enough to eventually buy her very first plane. It was yellow, so she called it the canary. A canary is a little yellow bird. So one day, Amelia flew the canary 14,000 feet into the sky. In doing this, she set a world record for women pilots. She flew higher than any woman ever did before. She was only flying as a hobby at this stage, and she was actually a school teacher at the same time. Which makes sense because um, <clears throat> some of the coolest people around are school teachers. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Maybe you've heard differently. Anyway, so in 1928, Amelia and another pilot named Wilmer Schultz flew across the Atlantic from Newfoundland to Britain. So let's go over to the map and just let's check out the route that they would have flown. So they would have started in Newfoundland over here in Canada and they flew all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and they landed in, whoops, need to go a little bit higher to get to Britain, boom, right there in Britain. Now this trip made her the first woman to ever fly across the Atlantic Ocean. They flew over 3,000 kilometers. When they returned from that trip, they were very famous. They met the President of the United States and the newspapers called her the Queen of the Air. She toured around America speaking about being a pilot. Now remember, this was at a time where there were very few women pilots around. And it was also very hard for women to get the same rights as men with regards to getting jobs. So when Amelia toured all around America, and spoke, she was spreading a message to young girls, saying that women could be pilots too, and they could get whatever jobs they wanted. She was a huge inspiration to young women everywhere. Amelia's next goal was to fly across the entire United States of America, which she completed. So she would have flown from west to east, or from east to west, and depending on where she started, the distance was probably around four and a half thousand kilometers. Now in 1932, she wanted to set another record. She flew across the Atlantic all on her own. So again, she flew from Newfoundland, but instead of landing in Britain, she actually landed in Northern Ireland. She even landed in a farmer's field. So the farmer heard this ruckus and asked her had she travelled far. And she replied, why? What country is this? Now the farmer probably couldn't believe that such a small little aeroplane could travel all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, in 1935, Amelia started planning an around the world trip. So her and her team did work on her airplane to make it worthy of such a long journey. She and the navigator named Frank Noonan flew from California in the southern part of America to Miami. Then they went to South America, across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa, and then over to India and into Asia. Now this was a very, very long and difficult flight. They eventually got to a place called Papua New Guinea. Now the journey at this point was over 35,000 kilometers. So they would have flown down here and down to South America, across to Africa, to India, over to Asia, and eventually whew, to Papua New Guinea. So they've flown all the way from the States to Papua New Guinea. Unbelievable. Now unfortunately, the next destination for them was Howe Island, which is just off the coast of Australia. Now Howe Island is so small that it's not even on this map here. They never arrived to Howe Island and the mystery of Amelia became real. People think that their plane went down somewhere in the Pacific Ocean over here, but it's still a mystery as to what exactly happened. One thing's for sure though, before Amelia Earhart and Frank Noonan's disappearance, she was definitely doing something that she loved.
Amelia Earhart showed the world that people can do incredible things when they set their minds to it. She also showed the world that girls can do adventurous things like be pilots and break records as well. All through her life, Amelia Earhart set targets for herself and she worked really hard to get them. Even if it was just working a low paying job to save up enough money to get those first flight lessons. She set her targets to something and she did everything she could to make it happen. There was no stopping her, which is actually a great message for everyone. So when Amelia set off on her trip around the world, Amelia's plane wouldn't have looked like this. This has lots of windows in it. This is a passenger plane and it's a newer model. Her one would probably have had propellers on it and would have looked older. But nonetheless, they made a lot of modifications to her plane to try and make sure that it was able for those really long journeys. So I've got a great idea. Why don't you design your very own plane and send us in pictures of your designs? You can add whatever you want to it. Is Mishamunter Kleena Agus Faltero Kleik Mishomaranga? Now, today we are going to be doing some geography. The sun is back in our skies. Let's hope it stays that way. Because this means that we can do some interesting investigation on the sun. Let's go. Okay, so the first question I have is how does the sun affect our seasons? Let's begin with this orange. Okay, so I have a globe here, but if you don't have a globe at home, you can use an orange or an apple or any kind of round piece of fruit. So, let us pretend that the orange is the earth. Now, there is an invisible line that splits the earth into two hemispheres, okay? So can you see it on my globe here? So there is an invisible line that splits my globes into two hemispheres. We have the Northern Hemisphere and we have the Southern Hemisphere. Northern because it's up north and Southern because it's down south. Now this invisible line that splits the Earth is called the equator. Now, can you tell me which hemisphere we are in? Let's see, Carl Wilmwoods. Where am I at all? Oh, yeah, so we are up here. So that means we are in the Northern Hemisphere. That's right. Okay, so what you can do at home, I'm going to use my globe, but what you can do at home is you can split your orange into two hemispheres. So I'm going to use a marker or anything that helps you make a line. Now my line isn't going to be perfect because the surface of this orange is porous and wrinkly. And there we are. So you can split this and we'll pretend that Ireland, we'll say that Ireland is somewhere, oops, up here. Now, eh. So, what we are going to do is see how the sun affects the seasons. So you can use your orange and I am going to use this globe. Now, we are going to pretend that this torch is the sun, okay? So, the Earth tilts at around 23.5 degrees maximum for half of the year. So for half of the year, it's tilted, so this is it um, level, and it tilts 23.5 degrees north, and then 23.5 degrees south for the other half of the year. Okay, so I'm going, for the purposes of this, I'm going to switch off the lights. Okay, so here is the sun. Now the sun isn't going to move. Okay, the earth is level now, but if it tilts south, 23.5 degrees, what hemisphere is receiving the most sun? That's right, the northern hemisphere and what portion is now receiving the most sun? The Southern Hemisphere. 
But do you notice, is there any portion of the earth or any piece of the earth that's receiving sun constantly? That's right, it's the equator. And it's along the equator that we have the warmest temperatures because the sun is more or less constantly on it. So if the earth is tilted south 23.5 degrees, that means it's our summer. So our days are longer because the sun is concentrated on the northern hemisphere. But if it's pointed 23.5 degrees north, that means it's summer in the southern hemisphere. Okay? So we can also see where the sun rises and sets by pointing our torch at our globe or at our orange. Okay? So the earth spins in an anti-clockwise motion. So the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Very good. So let's say during our summer, during our summer, uh, let's go like this. You can see that the sun is pointed at, the sun is shining on the northern hemisphere and our days are longer. So in fact, in the southern hemisphere, the days are shorter because there's less sun. And then the same in the reverse. Okay, very good. And you can try this at home with your orange and shine along the equator and tilt to see. So currently, which way is, this, is the earth tilting? It's tilting south, more or less at 23.5 degrees, which means that we are entering our summer seasons. Very good. So that means we have longer days. So that's when people say there's a great stretch in the evenings. It's because we're moving into our summer and that the earth is tilting towards 23.5 degrees. Now, there we go. So now we are going to learn how to track the sun's movement. So we have an idea now about the effects of the sun on our earth in terms of our days, but let's track the sun's shadows. And we are going to make our very own sundial, okay? So the first step in this experiment is to create the gnomon for the sundial. So to do this, we are going to take a small amount of clay. Now I'm going to use a bit of this. It's rather stiff, so I'm going to Try to warm it up using my hands. Now, if you have Play-Doh at home, that's great. If you have clay at home, that's great. If you don't, and I actually make this sometimes myself, you can make your own clay using water, salt, and some flour. And it's the same thing. You kind of just need to make a little uh, ball of dough, okay? So I'm rolling this and I'm warming it up my hands. <sighs> So I'm going to flatten the bottom of the clay ball so it doesn't roll around on a flat surface. Now, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to place a pencil directly into the center of the modeling clay ball so that the pencil will stand freely. Now, I'll just jam that down. There we go. Make sure it's nice and stiff. So I'm going to take some cardboard or some card you can see I'm using a cereal box but you can use even um, you could really use some paper if you're stuck and I'm just going to oopsie daisy and here I go I'm just going to Cut out a little rectangle so you could use a page would do the same thing. If you want, you can round it off like a traditional sundial. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to, oops, I am going to place an X on the bottom center of the cardboard. X marks the spot, okay? And this is where I am going to place my pencil and modeling clay. Okay, so if you want to be really sure that nothing moves, then you can glue it if you want. But I think this should stay so long as it's not a super windy day. Okay, so now I have placed my pencil at the bottom center of the cardboard where the X has been marked. Okay, 
Now, what I'm going to do next, well, I'm not going to do it in here, but what you're going to do next is find an open space that is directly in the sun for most of the day. So, for example, if you have a patio or a back garden, you could put it out there. And if you don't have a garden, you could actually really leave it in the window on a windowsill. Um, it's, it not, you won't get the same amount, but you can get a good idea, okay? So make sure the surface is flat and as level as possible because I don't want the sundial on a tilted or on a sloped surface because it's going to skew my measurements. So, for example, if I was doing one, I would put it at the bottom of my garden, maybe on a flat area of concrete. Also, if you wanted to, you could elevate it and place it on the place a plastic container on the bottom of it to make sure that it receives the most sun. Okay, now. What you're going to do is you're going to align your sundial so that the first shadow, because it's going to create a shadow cast on the cardboard, is located on the left hand side of your sundial. So this is where you're going to start. Okay, so the sundial will be pointed towards a northern direction if we live in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so we'll be, we'll be able to tell that if the shadow is cast on the left at the beginning of the day, our sundial is pointing north. So that's kind of a cool way to discover where north is, okay? Now, the next thing you are going to do is you're going to mark your first hour on the sundial. Now, I can't bring the sun into my classroom for health and safety reasons, so I'm going to be using a torch instead, okay? So for the purposes of this, I'm going to switch my lights off. Great. Now, let's imagine that this is the sun, okay? So can you see the shadow that's being cast here? So let's imagine that the sun is high in the sky. So you are going to move your sundial to make sure that it's starting on the left, okay? And then you're going to make a, a rule. You're going to get a little ruler or even like some another pencil if you wanted to. And you're going to align it with the piece of, with the shadow that it's making, okay? And then, what you do is you would make, oopsie daisy. So you'd make a line somewhere in there. And let's imagine that it's noon, so it's 12, okay? So what you do then is you wouldn't go out every half an hour, but you could go out every hour. So from 12 onwards, so then let's say it's one o'clock. So let's say at one o'clock, the shadow is being cast and make sure that your sundial is not moving otherwise um, the experiment will not work. So let's say that's one o'clock and we'll do one more as though it were two o'clock. Okay. Now I'm going to switch my lights back on. So you can use, you should use the same clock for each recording so that the sundial will be consistent. So make sure you could use um, a clock on the TV, on the computer and your watch as long as you make sure that it's the right time, okay? So what you can do is monitor the sundial as the day goes on and trace the shadow that's created every hour. And make sure that you're writing the hour that you're taking it at. So at 12 o'clock it's here, one o'clock it's here, two o'clock it's there, okay? So continue to trace and write correlating times as long as the sun is available. So pick a really sunny day to get the most out of it. As the day progresses, the shadows will begin to grow in size in time as the evening hours grow closer. So the science behind this observation is that the shadows are smaller around noon because the sun is directly above the sundial's location. So this means that it'll only cast a small shadow so if you start maybe at nine o'clock in the morning is a pretty good time to start. So as the earth continues to rotate and the sun appears lower in the sky towards the evening the shadows will grow longer. Have you ever noticed when you're outside playing maybe during the day if you're playing around noon you'll notice that the shadows are pretty short around you and then if you're playing longer into the evening you'll notice that they're growing longer and longer and longer. So when the sundial is completed, it should look as if the sundial is divided into relatively equal sections coming out from our gnomon, okay?
This observation makes sense because each hour is marked based on 60 minutes. For example, from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., there are 60 minutes that have gone by. From 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., there are also 60 minutes of elapsed time. Okay, so there you have it. I hope you have a better understanding of the sun and its effects on the seasons. We have also learned how to track the sun and its shadows and how to tell time using the sun. So if all else fails, if all your clocks break, if the energy goes out or anything like that, or the electricity goes in your house, at least you can take your very own sundial out and you can tell the time. But test yourself. Why don't you do a sundial, take it out the next day and see if it actually corresponds and if you can tell the time. I hope you enjoyed learning all about the sun and that you go out and investigate it for yourselves. Slav! Steve, how are you? I just need to have a little... Just give me a little sip of my... That's the good stuff. Coffee, eh? It's great, isn't it? Actually, most of you probably don't drink coffee. And you might have even tasted coffee before and said, blah, that's disgusting. And to be honest, I didn't like the taste of coffee the first time I tried it either. But I'm a little bit older now and I love it. So the other day I was having my coffee and I was thinking about School Hub and what lessons I'd like to teach you and bam! I realized that the answer was in my hand, in my cup. So I started doing some research and you would not believe how interesting the story of coffee actually is. So here we go. Now, on the desk in front of me, I have coffee in different forms. I also have a picture of a coffee bean growing. Check that out. So as well as that, we have roasted coffee beans. We have ground roasted coffee beans. So basically they take these, they grind them up and this is what it looks like. And we also have some freeze dried instant coffee. Now that stuff you can just add hot water to and away you go. Did you know that coffee is the second most drunk liquid on the whole planet? Have a guess what the first one is. You might be thinking, well, if coffee's the second most drunk liquid, maybe it's tea or orange juice. Nope, the answer is water. So let's just think about that for a second. Coffee is the most drunk liquid on the whole planet after water. So, 450 million cups of coffee drunk every single day. And that's just in the United States of America, just here. Now, that's a lot of coffee, but the crown has to go to Finland. The average person in Finland drinks 12 kilograms of coffee every single year. Now you might remember kilograms from a maths lesson that I did. So that's 12 bags of sugar worth of coffee every year. And when you think about it, in one cup of coffee, there's roughly maybe two spoonfuls. That'll make a good cup of coffee. So if you're only using two spoonfuls per cup of coffee, 12 kilograms, that's a lot of coffee. So why does coffee give an energy boost? Well, coffee has lots of caffeine in it. Now, adults can afford to take a small amount of caffeine into their system but children are still developing, so you don't need caffeine. In fact, it's recommended that anybody under the age of 12 should avoid caffeine altogether. So where does this drink come from? Where was it discovered? And why is the whole world crazy for a cup of joe? A cup of joe is another word for coffee, by the way. So let's start with where. So there are a few theories as to where the story of coffee starts, but most of these theories start in Ethiopia in Africa, which is right here, and Yemen in the Middle East, which is just over here. 
So we can be pretty sure that coffee originated from this area on Earth. Now, as well as that, we don't know exactly when coffee came on the scene either, but we do know that it's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I'm going to tell you two of the stories around the theory of coffee, and you can tell me which one you think is most believable. The first one starts in Ethiopia, in Africa. A shepherd named Kaldi was minding his goats. But after a while, he noticed something very strange. His goats got very excited after eating a particular red berry. They were jumping and prancing and dancing. In short, they were some very giddy goats. So Kaldi took some of these berries himself and he noticed that he too felt very energized after eating them. So Kaldi got very excited and he brought these berries to a nearby monastery to share with the monks that lived there. Now the head monk was a bit nervous of these berries, which made Kaldi act so energetic. So he actually took them and threw them into the fire. Now the smell that came from the burning berries ah, was a beautiful coffee smell. Have you ever smelled coffee in the morning? A lot of people don't like coffee, but they still love the smell. And you might see in films when someone is oh, very, very sleepy, someone might say to them, hello in there, wake up and smell the coffee, because it makes you alert. So after the fire had burned out, the monks changed their mind because the smell had been so good. So they picked up the burnt coffee beans and they put them in hot water. And lo, boys and girls, the first cup of coffee was invented. Now let's hear the other story of where coffee came from. Remember I showed you Yemen on the map in the Middle East? As the story goes, a man named Sheikh Omar was a famous healer then. Now we're not sure why, but Omar was actually banished from the village and he went to live in the desert in a cave. And one day he was so hungry that he ate some berries from a nearby bush. Now they were a little bit bitter, so he didn't really like them at the start, but he was starving. So he decided to roast them over a fire and put them in water to make sure he was getting some sort of nutrients. So in doing that, he created the first cup of coffee and was invited back to the village to share with them this drink that gave them energy. It's a little bit of a similar story. Now we can't be sure which one of these actually happened, or if either of them actually happened at all. But we can be fairly sure that coffee was invented in that region, just beside Ethiopia and Yemen. So the next question I have, where does coffee grow? Coffee is grown a lot of different places in the world, but generally, anywhere north and south of the equator here, coffee is found. This is actually called the coffee bean belt. Now, there's actually a sad part of the coffee story. See, unfortunately, coffee growers around the world are not always looked after. For years, coffee farmers in poorer countries would do all the hard work, like growing the coffee bean, harvesting the coffee bean, and then selling it to rich men from other countries for a very, very small amount of money. So those rich men would take the coffee and sell it to bigger companies for a higher price. So this made the rich businessmen even richer, but the poor coffee farmers wouldn't get much money at all. So this exploitation of coffee workers in poorer countries was happening for years until the introduction of fair trade. And here's the logo. So the poor farmers and their friends set up coffee cooperatives. So they used all their farms together to sell bigger amounts of coffee. So they basically decided to cut out the middleman by selling directly to the big coffee companies. So let's just go over that very quickly. I'm the farmer in a poorer country. I'm doing all the work. I'm growing the coffee. I'm picking the beans. I'm drying them out and I'm selling them to a businessman. So this businessman takes the coffee and gives the farmer a small amount of money then he takes that coffee and sells it to a bigger company and he gets a lot more money. So this rich man is getting richer, 
The coffee companies are happy because they're getting their coffee. So who loses out? The poor farmer is doing all the work. Now fair trade means that they're getting paid a proper wage for the hard work they're doing. They're growing the coffee, bypassing the middleman and selling it directly to the big coffee companies. Now that's great for a few reasons. It can mean that the farmers can use that money to develop their own communities by building hospitals and buying proper farming equipment. This is fair trade, which set out to pay workers in developing countries a fairer wage for the work that they do. So when you're out shopping and you see this logo, that means that whoever grew or made the product got a good deal for it and they weren't exploited. Now fair trade doesn't cover just coffee. There are loads of different products. It could be anything from coffee, like we've talked about, bananas, cocoa, cotton for socks, rice, and even footballs. So when you're out shopping and you see this logo, it's okay to buy that product because whoever made the product you're buying got looked after for it. Okay, let's go over what we've learned and recap on the story of coffee. So the coffee is grown on a farm in somewhere like Ethiopia. Now I say Ethiopia because I actually like the goat story of Kaldi. So I'm gonna say that that's where the coffee originates from. Coffee bean is grown and picked and it's dried out. The coffee bean is sold, hopefully through fair trade, and it is roasted. Then it's put into packets by coffee companies and distributed in supermarkets. We buy the fair trade coffee, we grind it, and we put it into hot water and hey presto, a warm drink that makes you peppy for a few hours. Ah. Now, what I'd love is I'd love to see you do a picture of the story of coffee from growth to cup, just so I know that you completely understand how fair trade works. I can homeschool hub is Misha Moonsar Cleana. Now I'm very excited today because we are going to be making an installation of the solar system. But what is a solar system? Let's find out. The solar system is the sun and all the objects that orbit around it. So to orbit means to circle around something. The sun is orbited by planets, asteroids, comets and other things. The solar system is about 4.6 billion years old. It was formed by gravity in a large molecular cloud. Most of this matter gathered in the center and the rest flattened into an orbiting disk that became the solar system. It is thought that almost all stars formed by this process. So, unfortunately, we can't view our solar system with the naked eye all the time. At different times of the year, we can see certain planets, but wouldn't it be really cool to make our own solar system that we can look at any time? It certainly would. So let's get started. So you need Play-Doh, some kind of clay or plasticine, but if you don't have it, you can make your own using flour, salt, oil, and warm water, and then use a bit of food coloring or a bit of paint, um, depending on what colors you want to use. Or if you don't want to get your hands messy at all like that, you know what you could do? You can just cut out little circles and then color those in as your planets and just use, make a paper mobile. It would just look just as beautiful. So here is my frame. I have two sticks and it doesn't matter what kind of sticks you could go out and see what you can find on the ground. So two sticks, you can tie them together with string or you can glue them. So I have um, two sticks glued here. So we're gonna start by making our sun. So our sun is the center of our solar system. And we are going to make that using red and yellow. So what I'm gonna to do to start is I'm just gonna tie a piece of string around the center here because my sun is actually going to um, hang from the center. Okay, so the sun is actually a star. It's called a yellow dwarf star and it gives off energy as light. That includes light, infrared energy, heat, ultraviolet light and radio waves. Scientists think that the sun started from a very large cloud of dust and small bits of ice around 4.567 billion years ago. So for my sun, oh, I have these lovely colors here. I'm gonna pick kind of oranges and yellow. Because I know when we think about the sun, we think, oh, it's yellow. But actually, we know by looking at pictures from space 
that it's got uh, different shades of yellow and orange in it, which is exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start mushing my plasticine up so that my colors are nicely mixed. And actually that looks really cool already. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the string kind of in the middle and I'm going to up close the plasticine around it like that. And I'm gonna do the same really with all of my planets. So I just need to try to make this as round now. It's probably not perfectly round even in space. So we'll just do our level best to make it into a lovely circle. Now, and I'm gonna tie a little knot to keep it secure. And I'm gonna cut the rest off. And there, oops. There we have the start of our mobile. We have our sun in the center, okay? Next, we're going to make Mercury, which is kind of a gray. Okay, so Mercury is the smallest planet in the solar system. It is the closest planet um, to the sun. It makes one trip around the sun once every 87.969 days. Mercury looks like Earth's moon. It has many craters and areas of smooth plains. It has no moons around it and no atmosphere as we know it. So I have my sun in the middle, so I'm gonna tie Mercury here. I'm gonna cut that there. And once again, and I'm just like splicing it into the middle there. Now right, and smooth out, even though we know that it's not smooth, it's got craters and stuff in it, just like the moon. Okay, oops. <laughs> now, so there we have the sun and we have Mercury, okay? Next, we're going to make Venus. So Venus is a very, very light gray. So I'm gonna use a tiny bit of gray here and mostly white. Okay, so Venus is the second planet from the sun. It has a day longer than a year. So its day is actually longer than a year. Can you imagine that? The year length of Venus is 225 Earth days. On Venus, the sun rises every 117 Earth days. That means the sun only rises two times each Earth year on Venus. It is a terrestrial planet because it has a solid rocky surface like other planets in the inner solar system. Astronomers have known Venus for thousands of years. The ancient Romans named it after their goddess Venus. Venus is the brightest thing in the night sky except for the moon. It's sometimes called the morning star or the evening star. So let's hang Venus. So I'm gonna hang Venus. I'm gonna go to the next branch of my stick and I'm gonna hang it there. So it's the second closest to the sun. Now, so I'm gonna just put it slightly further away than I put Mercury. And I'm gonna cut this piece off and then I'm gonna splice this in here and I'm gonna do my double knot again. So I'm just gonna roll that around, good. And So let's see how we're getting on. So now we've done Mercury and we've done Venus. So look, we've already kind of got what looks like a proper solar system going. Now, next we are going to make our home Earth. Okay, so we know that the Earth looks blue and green from space. Now, the Earth is a terrestrial planet. It is the third planet from the sun, and it's the only planet known to have life on it. The Earth formed around 4.5 billion years ago. It is one of the four rocky planets inside of the solar system. Earth is the only planet in the solar system that has a large amount of liquid water. About 74% of the surface of the Earth is covered by liquid or frozen water. Because of this, some people sometimes call it the blue planet. So I'm going to do the earth next. And I'm popping the earth over here. So third planet from the sun. So we're going further and further away. Now I'm just going to pop this in here like that. Just a little knot and that's fine. Just in case it falls. Now time for little bits of green and I don't need to put that much on. I'm just going to put on a little bit so that it kind of looks like earth from space. And you could even make sure that you have Ireland in there. Okay, so let's see how we're doing so far. Let's hang it up. Oh, and that is looking so cute. Okay, so it's the third planet from the sun. Great, next let's make Mars, which is a red color. 
Okay, so Mars is the fourth planet from the sun and the second smallest planet in our solar system. In English, Mars carries the name of the Roman god of war and it's often referred to as the red planet because the reddish iron oxide prevalent on its surface gives it a reddish appearance. And that's distinctive among the astronomical bodies visible to the naked eye. Mars can easily be seen from Earth as can its reddish colour. So Mars is a terrestrial planet with a thin atmosphere, having surface features like those of the impact craters of the Moon and valleys, deserts and polar ice caps of Earth. It has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, which are small and irregularly shaped. So let's pop Mars up here now. So Mars is on my fourth branch over here. Okay, Mars on your pop, forming that around it. Now, have a little knot tied in it, and let's have a look to see how we're getting on. Oh, well, that looks so cool. You can just imagine looking up at that and just thinking about it. Okay, next, let's make Jupiter, which is gray, purple, and yellow looking. So we're gonna have to do a lot of um, mixing here in these colors now to make it look right. So Jupiter is a gas giant, both because it's so large and because it's made out of gas, a gas giant. The other gas giants are Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Jupiter has a mass of about 318 Earths. So Jupiter has the, like the weight or the size of 318 Earths. Can you imagine? This is twice the mass of all the other planets in the solar system put together. Jupiter can even be seen without the use of a telescope. It was known to the ancient Romans who named it after their god Jupiter. Jupiter has at least 79 moons. Of these, around 50 are very small and less than five kilometers wide. So when you go for your five kilometer walk, you can imagine that you're walking about the size of a Jupiter moon. Now, and we're going to hang Jupiter. So it's the biggest planet in our solar system. Patch that through. And then we have Jupiter on it. Now, let's hang it up and see how we're getting on. Pretty good. Next, let's make Saturn, which is kind of a taupe color. So taupe is like a kind of camel color. Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun in the solar system, and it's the second largest planet in the solar system after Jupiter. Like Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune, it is a gas giant. Saturn has 62 known moons orbiting the planet. 53 are officially named. So could you imagine there's 53 of them that have names. The largest moon is Titan, which is larger in volume than the planet Mercury. Titan is the second largest moon in the solar system. So I'm gonna tie Saturn on here. And I need to make sure that I put my ring on Saturn as well. So Saturn has a ring forcing it through it. Good, and I'm gonna put a kind of yellow ring around it. So, all right, there we are, and there's Saturn. Now, we're nearly there. Next, we're going to make Uranus, which is a lovely light blue, okay? So Uranus is the seventh planet from the sun in the solar system. It is a gas giant. It is the third largest planet in the solar system. So the planet is made out of ice, gases, and liquid metal. The planet is tilted on its axis, so much so that it orbits sideways, okay? So normally we think of an orbit of going around kind of like in a proper circle, but this kind of orbits kind of at a diagonal kind of um, angle. So it has five big moons, many small ones, and a small system of 13 planetary rings. Good heavens. Now, so let's tie that on. Off we go. So the distance between Uranus and the Sun is about 2.8 billion kilometers. Uranus completes its orbit around the Sun in 84 Earth years. It completes a spin around itself in 17 hours and 14 minutes. This means that there are about 43,000 Uranian days in one Uranian year. We have 365 days a year, they have 43,000. Uranus is named after the Greek god Uranus, who is god of sky. Now, let's see. Gorgeous, look at that. So cool, and it's swinging away. 
Okay, so last we are going to make Neptune, which is a lovely deep blue. Neptune is the eighth and last planet from the sun in the solar system. It is a gas giant. It's the fourth largest planet and third heaviest. Neptune has four rings which are hard to see from the Earth. It is 17 times heavier than Earth and is a little bit heavier than Uranus. It was named after the Roman god of the sea. So Neptune, you might have heard that before. Neptune's atmosphere is mostly made up of hydrogen and helium. It also contains small amounts of methane which make the planet appear blue. And I'm just going to tie this on here. Okay, now, oops, and that is our solar system. So have a look at that, swinging away. So you can feel free to add Pluto if you like, but as it's a dwarf planet, I'm going to leave it out of mine. Now, we've threaded them all through so that they can be suspended from the sticks and we've balanced it out so the mobile can hang nicely. And there we have it, we have made a beautiful solar system mobile. Why not hang it above your bed or make yourself a little thinking place somewhere and relax under it and take a journey through our solar system. Safe travels. Slán!